Welcome to the Ink to Film Podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm Luke. And I'm James. And this week, we discuss the second half of Richard K. Morgan's 2002 post cyberpunk novel, Altered Carbon. Now let's needle cast to another planet and start a new life. So we have read the second half of Altered Carbon, and man, what a ride. Yeah, definitely. A ride is a good description because this was a roller coaster story for me. Yeah, me too. I mean, it goes it goes so many cool places that I'm definitely excited to talk about, but I wanted to go ahead and say that we're going to start with a light spoiler section. I don't want to say no spoilers because talking about even the tech you know, it's in and of itself, it's going to be a light spoiler, but we're going to try not to get into any of the plot. It's we're going to say, stay to just the tech and the world and that kind of stuff, right? Yep. And maybe general thoughts. Definitely. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So I wanted to revive, first off, I said Kovacs for every, like every time I said his name in the first episode, and I'm surprised you didn't correct me. It's Kovach. Um, I, and I heard you say, I couldn't understand if you were saying Kovach or Kovacs during our last episode recording. Yeah, I was saying Kovacs, but in my defense, I think in the book it says that like some characters call him Kovacs because they can't pronounce it correctly, yes. and so that must have just lodged in my head. So that's my only de- defense I have for it. Kovach, I will try and get it right. I mean, we should also mention the fact that we we're both listening to it as an audiobook, so to yeah. not be able to see the lettering, it's it's kind of throws you off sometimes. Yeah, well, and th- it's actually less of an excuse because I should have heard it correctly in that you know what i mean anyway yeah. um <laughs> uh so i also wanted to revise my suggestion that like everybody read this book again um i still really love this book um the my revision is i want to say this book is extreme and i don't know that i pointed that out enough in the non-spoiler section last time and when i say extreme i mean it's got graphic violence extremely graphic sex it's got depictions of sexual violence um, goes really dark places and yeah I just wanted to say so you know I, I should have said it last time like if that kind of stuff is going to bother you then this isn't a good book for you to read so I mean what you just said is is really telling of like what I what what kind of leads into what I wanted to say about it is that I feel like this is like a very like gritty violent way of of uh, doing the classic like noir tale where you're in the under, underbelly of society and you're doing the detective work and all that stuff. Whereas your classic noirs, they would, you could tell that there was obviously things going on. This shows you like the drugs, the sex, the, the murder and all of that stuff very blatantly on display. Yeah, for sure. Um, I retweeted something from Richard K. Morgan on Twitter um, in which he was saying, I can't, I can't, I'm not going to read it verbatim, but he was reacting to some of the early reviews for Altered Carbon. Did you see this on, on the Twitter account? Yep, I saw it. Yeah, so he was reacting to it, and he was kind of, seemed like he was delighting in the fact that a lot of reviewers, there was some hand-wringing about how much sex and violence there is in the show. And his response is essentially that he feels like science fiction has been relegated to like the YA safe zone for far too long, and that he wants to tell an adult story with adult themes and adult content. And, you know, more power to him. I, I, I respect that that is something he cares about. Yeah. It, it, like the sex scenes specifically remind me more of something that you would, that I, you would read in like a fantasy novel. Really? Like, Depends on the kind of fantasy. Because it, it, a lot of fantasy is very is also very YA. It just I mean, look at Tolkien. Like there's no sex yeah, in Tolkien. Yeah, that is true. But I, I meant like more like George R. R. Martin. Yeah, sure. Yeah. He's, he's in, in line with a George R. R. Martin or Joe Abercrombie or... Scott Lynch or somebody like that in the fantasy world. For yeah, I think he's right there. Some people call him grimdark, like he's a grimdark um, sci-fi. sci-fi writer. But that's, I mean, we're getting into the nitty gritty of genre conventions, which I don't think is super interesting to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but yeah, I mean, other, any other like what, what, what how, this book in general like is this? Have you read any other what 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 I would call cyberpunk novels other than this and Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? No, not really. Honestly, like there, were, I think there were a couple that I read that were they weren't like it wasn't anywhere near as extreme as this or as like philosophical as do androids dream yeah i think for me i i haven't either um i've always been someone who has loved sci-fi growing up and but i primarily consumed it in movie form and that was not the true for fantasy like i read tons of fantasy but for sci-fi whatever reason I, i tended to watch it and not read it um, so I have seen lots, I mean, you can look at like the matrix and there's, there's all kinds of titles out there that are cyberpunk, but I've never, yeah, this is only the second book like this, I guess I've read other than the Philip K. Dick one. And so, I mean, it is interesting to see, I mean, they're written so far apart, probably like what, 40, 50 years apart. And there's a lot of big differences, but interesting similarities too. Yeah. The thing that I was th- that I kept thinking of, obviously, like this, this book reminds me a lot of Do Androids Dream and of Blade Runner, but something that I I was getting a lot of also was um, Ghost in the Shell. Like I was feeling a lot of Ghost yeah, in the Shell as I read this novel throughout, and just kind of the vibe, and there was the, like the Japanese culture was at the forefront in this book as well as in in uh, Ghost in the Shell. So I just like a lot, there's a lot of similarities that that it, I kind of envisioned a lot of the things like ghost in the shell tech yeah that's kind of an anime blind spot for me i haven't ever actually watched the full thing i think i've seen episodes here and there that's it well the movie and i didn't the see i didn't like see the, the movie okay yeah the movie is like the the thing that you should definitely check out you're talking about the the anime not the new remake the yes. remake yes the animated film not the i haven't even seen the new one yeah i haven't seen that one okay i skipped i haven't seen it either uh, i heard it was bad uh, yeah, so I think what we're talking about here is that there's a lot of philosophical questions that get raised about tech and about what it means to be human and how humans may be different or similar to altered um, humans or to synthetic humans, uh, whether it's a replicant or or what have you. You know what I mean? Like, it's a lot of same questions. Um, I think there's also the show Westworld, I think, deals in a lot of the same stuff. And I'm seeing altered carbons being compared to that a lot i think when i when i see it in the in the promotions so i mean i love that show so I, I i can see why people would compare it yeah i can definitely see those comparisons so something else that i wanted to ask you was um just about the story in general how how many red herrings and and like what i'm trying to ask is wh- how much of what happens did you see coming and like what like twists and turns because i i honestly was just along for the ride i couldn't i couldn't figure it out until late in the game yeah, I mean, I guess I, I, it's a minor spoiler, I guess, to say that we were completely wrong with our predictions last time, <laughs> um, but we won't get into the end to the house. And that's only if you listen to the end of our spoiler section last time, would you even know? But we made some predictions and yeah, they were way wrong. I was kicking myself and I think I'm going to be better in the future because there are certain things about the mystery to this novel that are extremely important that I should have seen coming narratively. Um, I will talk more about that in the spoiler section, but I don't want to get into it here because I think it might be too spoilery. Okay, so it's safe to say that both of us were kind of just like, we we didn't see much coming. Oh, I was super surprised, but I kind of retroactively was like, I shouldn't have been as surprised as I was because I should have seen this coming if I'd thought about it. Yeah. Um, So last time we talked about, in our non-spoiler section, I believe, we were talking about the essentially what's called the teleporter paradox where if you get in a teleporter and teleport down to a planet and your body's constituted out of atoms that are down on the planet somewhere, essentially, you know what I mean? Like, are you the same person? Is the person who's teleported down there now that you're made out of something new, new atoms, reconstructed into the same makeup that you were? Are you a copy of yourself or are you you? And we talked about how that's kind of a gray area, right? Like, it's, it's kind of philosophical to try and even figure out what that means. Yeah it's concept of the soul do you have a soul and does it transfer or does it get left behind and that person dies like every time you tell in star trek every time they teleport are they dying you know what i mean i don't know yeah it's i mean it's such a good point even if you're not different yeah are you you right or did you die and now there's an exact identical copy of you that lives on yeah 
you know, and and that's in in and it's interesting because I did a, I I kind of fell down a rabbit hole doing research into this kind of thing, and there's a lot of really cool videos. I'm going to recommend a YouTube channel. Um, a lot of people probably know a very popular Vsauce, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and there's like there's a couple of them. There's like Vsauce two, Vsauce three, and they do a lot of. There's some really cool questions about this, and you can look at paradoxes and things like that, and they do some interesting talks about this, and. Uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up for this was the sh- uh, the ship of Theseus paradox. Have you heard Have you heard of this paradox? Not off the top of my head. What is it? Okay, so this this is another like wrinkle to this question. So the ship of Theseus paradox is about basically like a parable about the ship of Theseus. I don't know if it was real or not, like a real ship or not. I can't remember. I'm probably going to butcher this, but I'm going to try and get at the heart of what it's about. So essentially, you have this ship, and um, you know, it's gotten old and it's, it's sitting there and, and you go, well, you know what? I'm going to, I want to replace the, the, the sails. So I'm going to swap out the sails. I'm gonna get some new sails to make it better. When you swap out the new sails, is the boat you have still the same boat? Is it, is it the, like the name of the boat is Theseus. Let's say that. Is that, is that still your boat? Theseus? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what if like you got to change the mast? Is it still the same boat? Yes. Yeah, so you do that. So what if you got to re? What if you got to redo the whole entire deck because the whole deck's gotten rotted out, and you got to tear it up, and you got to change out the entire deck? Yeah, it's probably the same one. But I, I mean, I see where this is going. Yeah. So you see where this is yeah. going. You can take. You can do this for every single piece of wood on the ship, or whatever, whatever you have. You you swap it out one at a time. So this is a question about people. You know what I mean? Like, so say like I have, I have uh, some screws and stuff like in my ankle holding it together after an accident i was in you know is that still my leg yes of course right even though it's different now it's been changed it's been augmented right parts of it are lost parts of it have been introduced um and so this is a question people, people take it to the brain and they say you got to have section of your brain gets destroyed and so we're able to with technology do certain things to like simulate and help people with like certain degenerative diseases, right? And they put things into their brain to make it work. Are those people the same people? We say yes. So if you extrapolate that out, though, what happens is, you know, what what defines you? Like, who, who, what is you? And what? And you know, there's this whole thing about how um, our bodies regenerate atoms over time. Mm-hmm. And so, like, all the atoms in your body at this point are not the same atoms that were in your body when you were a baby. So are you the same person that you were when you were a baby becomes a question too, because you're not the same matter. Right. So ultimately, I think where I where I lead to is something that we haven't I don't think that we've scientifically been able to like point out and prove is the so so obviously what we get it what what we get down to with the boat analogy is that it's kind of it's an artificial construct, right? Like the idea of the boat it could we could replace everything on the boat and it could still be still be the same boat because it's what we the construct that we put on it um but like say you go into a person and and you're doing that i think the thing that separates you from from another perfect exact replica of you is consciousness right which is what just electrical signals in your brain and like i don't think that we've cra- i don't think that we've cracked the science or cracked like the the analysis in order to really say like if that's replicatable or or if it's if if the, you are beamed up and you have a new consciousness that's a new person you know what i mean yeah um yeah it's interesting i mean i don't know enough about like brain sciences to really get into it but but it's my understanding that there are like so say uh so you you're you're saying like if you took your brain out of your body and put it in a robot body then the robot is now you and your physical body is gone like that's fine I, I, but not necessarily brain because I don't I don't know I mean I'm assuming consciousness comes from the brain but I but I'm just saying like the consciousness has to be there. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's in your brain. <laughs> I know, but I'm just saying like um, like we I don't know if we've proven that really though, right? Like, where is it? Well, there's a yeah, there's a lot of studies about it. I mean, it depends on if you want to get if you want to get metaphysical and talk about religion and talk about soul. I don't know. I mean, that's a lot of that stuff is by definition unprovable. Right. But as far as sciences are concerned, yes, your consciousness is in your brain. Um, and it's the way our brain thinks about itself is kind of the way that we have consciousness is that our brain is able to n- think about the fact that it is thinking. 
and you have this self image and you can think about your yourself and you can think about your own like it's like the ability to think about thinking is what gives us consciousness so, so what, that aware that being aware of the thoughts that we're having in this other like kind of other way so i guess where i end up on this is like if we if we are able to replicate and fully make another person that's you in every way and there is that consciousness there i think that it's got to be a different consciousness though right by every molecule it's it's the same but it's not the because say you're there if there's a clone and there's an exact clone of you yeah. that that there's a separate there is a separation in consciousness so, so when you were eight years old if every atom in your body has changed since you were eight years old are you the same person you were when you were eight years old yeah because of the consciousness because my like you know what i mean i've never severed that tie well, like that, your the matter that built you up in your brain even was was different. You're saying so the fact that you're con- you had continuity is maybe right. where you're. Going. I think once you break like that, continuity of consciousness. Once you break that, then you're so, dealing with is it new or is it the same? Yeah. So what happens when you're uh, when you're when you go to bed at night, or when you like me or are in a, in a coma, and you have no memory of a, a certain span of time, is the person who wakes up still you? Am I just a copy of the person who went to the went to the coma? And I woke up and now I'm a new person. That's a good point. Because I had no continuity. I mean, we, we, yeah. so this is why it's a paradox, right? This is why, like, there's no good answer to these questions. And it all, a lot of it, I mean, Vsauce has a video where he talks about how maybe the person we are now is a memory of, uh, like, a memory of the person who we used to be um, and, and maybe a, like, dream of the person who we want to be in this moment. And so it's really interesting. We, you know, you should watch the video to see how he gets to that point. Yeah, um, I, there's a my, lot of interesting kind of thought experiments you can do. He's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't remember which video exactly that is. I wish I did. I did. I know um, there's a Vsauce Vsauce three, which is I, I think his name's Jake. He has a video on the the Theseus paradox and a few other paradoxes like it. Um, I think the teleportation one and maybe as well. So that one's really cool. I think it's called like time travel paradoxes or something. So nice. or or some sort of paradoxes i'm not really sure logic paradoxes or something i don't know anyway check those out if you want if you want to dive into even more about this kind yeah, of yeah i was gonna say i want to do a call to action if people are listening right now i want somebody to, to to explain to us what they're like i want somebody else's viewpoint so i feel like we should ask people to like message yeah. us on facebook or twitter or something and tell us what they think and if they don't feel comfortable like posting it out to the ether they can just message us and then just for our own yeah. benefit i guess yeah, I'd love to get some more takes on this. Yeah, like where where do you fall on this question? Is a yeah, I think that's a great question for our listeners, and and I'd love to to read some of it, and and you know maybe we talk about it some in the in the in the TV episode if we have time, uh, maybe maybe just briefly. I want someone to be like everything you said is wrong, and this is why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're both idiots. Let me explain it to you. You know, and, and that might come. In, and that's probably going to bring up people's religious religious beliefs and stuff. But yeah, but no, but I want to yeah, hear that. Be interesting yeah. to see what to see what we hear. Yeah, that'd yeah. be cool. All right, so I think that's it for non spoiler talk. Uh, we are going to move on to spoiler talk. Get into get in depth. Talk about what happens. Uh, how this mystery is resolved. But before we do that, we wanted to take a second to talk to you about Audible. Yeah, Audible is a audiobook listening service and they've been nice enough to give us an affiliate link it's audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film and with that affiliate link you can get 30 free days for their service one free audiobook in their collection yeah and they have a gigantic collection almost every book that you can think of yeah i think every book that we've covered so far has been an audiobook on audible right Yes. Yeah, I think so. I, I use it when I work out. I use it when I walk the dogs. Anytime that I would be listening to a podcast, uh, I if I run out of podcasts for that for that week, I switch over and listen to an audio book or, or, you know, if maybe the audio book's a little more compelling than the podcast I listen to, I do that. Um, so if you're the kind of person who listens to podcasts, I think audio books are going to be right up your alley. Um, this week, I wanted to go ahead and recommend our next project, which is Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. Now, you may have seen the, pr- the trailer for it. There's a new movie coming out with Natalie Portman and Oscar Isaac, and it looks really cool, so I'm excited to get into that project, and we are going to be releasing our first book episode for that two weeks uh, from this episode dropping. But yeah, Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. The trailer for the- no, the sci-fi project. Yeah, the trailer for the, for the movie, looks, movie looks great. It's Alex Garland who did Ex Machina, so I'm sure it's going to be a fun time. 
for sure. Yeah, and if you want to get that, make sure you go to audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film and you can get that book for free and have 30 free days to listen to it before you get another book. All right, so we are in the spoiler section. So this is your last warning. If you don't want to be spoiled, get out now. Come back later, maybe. Um, but yeah, spoiler, spoilers are, are, uh, are a go. So let's get into what happens. Um, so last time we left them, they had just found out that the lawyer called two places, uh, the, the Bancroft residence and the, I believe the Panama Rose, which is where they go next. It's a ship that has been converted into like a fighting ring and I should also say we're not going to maybe go into every detail. We're going to try and do the same kind of thing we did last time where we where we move through this quickly. So I'm going to try and move through it quickly because there's a lot that happens. But yeah, at this fighting ring, they meet uh, someone named Carnage, who's in a synthetic sleeve, who has had past dealings with Riker. And so he he is uh, antagonistic towards towards uh, Takashi because of he's the sleeve he's in. While they're there, they they're like looking for bombs supposedly but they're not actually they're they're doing they're kind of just investigating and trying to figure out i think why the call went there and what connection it could possibly have to everything that's going on yeah this is this is interesting because we kind of get um kovach and and ortega together more here and like it was something that they like were slowly leaning into and i guess we'll get into it later but like i didn't really see their relationship developing the way it was until it actually did yeah, I don't know. Um, there was definitely some hints that there maybe is attraction there because he talks a lot about how his body, like they've they've done these studies where like the bot, like two sleeves have like a chemical reaction, like a hormonal reaction to each other. Mm-hmm. If you know when they're attracted to each other, and so there's a strong implication that his sleeve is attracted to her right and because of that, he is attracted to her. Like he's there's a lot. You know, one of the themes of this book, I think, is how we're that we're all slaves to our like biological need and then how that biological need can be manipulated or you know can change based off the sleeve you're in right yeah definitely and and that's the, we'll get into it as it as it comes up but that's kind of what we what we learn about their relationship is that like it is kind of this physical thing that happens almost like on its own and then it, and then we see the resolution of it and i don't know well, before we get to that, um, um, so 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 the, the, the this is just where something that becomes important later is introduced, right? Like we find out about the fighting floor. We find out that they do these these broadcasts for for like a legal fight. Sometimes we we find out what a humiliation bout is, um, all this kind of stuff, and then they leave. And uh, yeah, we we get uh, Curtis has shown up at the Hendrix, and he's he's super jealous. Um, so he's the driver for Marion Bancroft, and and apparently he's like in love with Marion Bancroft, and he seems to be just really jealous and upset that they slept together, uh, that her and her and Kovach slept together. Um, and uh, Kovach ends up breaking his nose at one point because he just like won't back off. Did you read that scene any differently? Uh, yeah, more of like the hardened detective classic noir thing. I feel like if if like somebody's giving you lip, like you can't let them you can't let them get away with it, kind of thing. Yeah, he does say something really cool there where he talks about how, as an envoy, he says, it would have been easier to kill you than it would have been to just break your nose. Like, he has to change his thinking and deliberately not kill because he's so trained to be, like, this weapon yeah. designed to kill, you know? So, like, his first instinct is to kill people, and he has to fight that. Which, I don't know, that's pretty cool. <laughs> it's cool, but it's also In a dark way. wild. Yeah, it's crazy. Because, like, he... So, like, only people who annoy him, like, a little bit. So, like, if somebody cut him in line at the supermarket, like, he's like, I'm going to fucking kill this guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, it sounds like some some problems that, like, you know, you hear about, like, special forces people have and stuff, too, you know, in real life. So I feel like there is some, like, basis for that, too, where, like, if you're trained to kill people... It can be really hard to get in a fu- like get in an argument with somebody back in like civilized society and not feel like you can go to extreme violence if that's what you've been trained to do. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, after after he leaves, Curtis leaves, and then Batista shows up, and he has this kind of heart to heart with him, and he tells him all about uh, Ortega and Riker and kind of their back history and how she's hold she's got this like flame for Riker where she thinks that he was framed and she really wants to get him freed from the stack 
and she's holding out hope. And that's why she's she hasn't given up on Riker because Riker right now is supposed to be in there for like 200 years or something. Yeah. Like he's he's just supposed to be gone. But she thinks she's going to be able to find evidence to free him. And that's what she's more concerned about. Right. And just to clear that up a little bit again, Kovach, our main character, is in the body of Riker now. So so the whole time that he's going around and doing stuff, this is a body that has a history with Ortega and has a history. Yeah, and she wants to like to protect it so that she can get him back into right. it. Right. So after that, they go to a virtual place and they meet with, I think, Lila Began to find out what she knows. She she was someone who um, Miriam Bancroft forced a miscarriage by beating her up. Right, we talked we about that. We had slept with Bancroft in the past. Yeah, yeah. we we'll talked about that last But they're time. meeting her. So it's, like meet- a pl- it's like almost like a phone call, right? So it's just like you yeah, can hang out with like, them Yeah, but they're in VR. They're like hacked into a VR cafe. We, we find out later. Yeah, yeah so they meet her and, they, and, and she kind of says that that bancroft needs to degrade and that's like his thing that he that gets him off or something um but she's kind of vague about it and she also warns that mary bancroft is a psychopath and that like he should be worried about her or he should you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like he should not be taking her lightly yeah something that he says there too is like kind of telling of like the world where he says like basically with everybody living forever now and and like people attaining this this kind of like met the meths of the world attaining this mm-hmm. power it's like basically who isn't a psychopath at this point yeah well and he says like i've been called a psychopath many times right. so they're all so, like detached yeah he kind of like, shrugs it off yeah. but yeah so after when they come out there it's a kind of a cool like surprise happens because they they're kind of coming out it's him and Kristen, and they're just talking and then all of a sudden they get ambushed and there's like multiple people in there. The the person who runs the cafe has been killed and they have to have this gunfight. And then at the end of it, the, the synthetic that is like all mangled and like half dead um, is still alive, though, and says that's fucking enough, which he knows is like this famous story mm-hmm. about someone who cr- like that was like how they self detonated was that. Th- and that was their famously their last words. And so he knows that the person that is doing this is Cadman because the last time he talked to Cadman, he was like saying all this Quellus stuff, which is this philosophy that I think includes this story. So anyway, it's a sign that he, he says something that makes him know that that's who that's who this is. And also know that he's about to blow up, um, which is a little bit dumb. Like, but I, I guess like you, you could, you could, you could wave it off and say that Cadman was in a situation where he thought for sure he was going to kill him. Um, but they, anyway, they're able to run out and kind of just get away far fast enough to where it explodes and then doesn't kill them. They get, they get knocked out into the street or whatever, but they don't die. Um, but the whole place explodes. Yeah, and they definitely did not look at the explosion. They they ran out of there because everybody knows that in the, these situations, you don't look at the explosion, you just walk away. That's right. Well, they ran and got blown out, the, <laughs> blown down the stairs or something. I don't think it was quite like a badass walk, yeah. but yeah. Cadman is the guy from that they met virtually before. So the fact that he's in another body, even though he's supposed to be locked up like forever, like this right. is like a big plot point because somebody's pulling strings to get this guy who's supposed to be locked. This is the guy who's like had like the creature arm and he like looks like yeah. animalistic and stuff. And so he's in a new sleeve and he's out trying to kill him again this is the second time he tries to kill him yeah and yeah the, uh kovach re- you know realizes all of this and uh as he's sitting with with ortega he tells this story about the patchwork man which i i guess i'll try and summarize but it's a pretty wild story it's about this like it's this old like legend that he grew up with from uh Raylan's world and it's apparently it told the kids to like keep them in line. And it's about this like mother who had like three kids who didn't help like around the house or didn't help her work. And so she ends up like murdering them, throwing them in like, I don't remember how she kills them, but she kills them all. And then she like stitches them together into this Frankenstein's monster being that's going to like help her do the work she needs to have done. And then what happens is this monster um starts to rot at like different pieces of it start to rot and so it starts to realize it needs to it also i think it kills the mother and then um 
it it realizes that it needs to replace parts of its body so it starts going around like hunting children and like it'll kill children and replace parts of its sections of its body that that have started to rot but it's like a constant need and it's just this monster called the patchwork man and he thinks of cadman this way yeah which is pretty pretty telling for how like scary this guy is yeah i feel like that would make a cool horror story on its own like that's pretty yeah in and of itself for sure so they decide they're going to lay low and they set a meet place set a place to meet and i think in a few days which we find out later is a ship and then they go their separate ways um she's going to do some research and try and find out if cadman is actually still in custody or not and he's going to go off and and continue the investigation on on his own um he taught he does talk to the doctor who sleeved him and he finds out this is what it, so he finds out that they're they're they put a tracker in him into his sleeve when he was coming which came which is illegal but he finds out that they did that um and he figures this out because he he um he know like cadman was able to track him too easily and he thinks like how you know how could he possibly track me and then it kind of dawns on him that he must have a tracker in his body we also find out some backstory for kovach here about his father who when he was like a 10 or 11 year old kid his father i guess died in war and then at the resle- or somehow and then at the resleeving facility he came out in a new body and instead of and apparently this is something that happens sometimes instead of reuniting with his family in this new body he just like walked past him and just went off to have a new life somewhere and you know this is something that apparently does happen uh fairly frequently so we you know it's got, uh, kind of a, a little bit of a insight into takashi's character i would say yeah it's definitely affected him and and um but he has like a soft spot for kids who don't have their who don't have a father kind of it seems like well and this is there are a few things about kobach that you know what i mean are like that make us like him i think this is one of those things and then like his he goes out of his way to help people certain people when he doesn't have to and that becomes more prevalent later but uh, i think that's an, like that part of him is what makes him like a good protagonist who we we want to cheer for yeah i think which is something i was going to mention because like his character at the beginning is kind of irredeemable he's like killing people who didn't necessarily need to die and just doing all the stuff but it's like his training kind of and then like in the end yeah. he's kind of this like he goes out of his way to do certain things that that put in at least leave a good taste in our mouths about his character i guess yeah so um, at this facility, he gets the doctor, Sullivan, and he wants to talk to him, ask him some questions. So he takes him out to this restaurant, and then while he's there, a woman shows up named Trep, who becomes important later. So Trep, Trep was actually someone who got killed by him in the car when they were leaving the, they were leaving the facility, the Y Clinic. So she was someone who worked at the Y Clinic. So they have a history, and like they're, they're back and forth right now is kind of like, he's like don't you hate me for killing you and she's like oh i don't remember it because her like her reset was like her 24 hour reset or whatever but when she comes back this time yeah she says like i i must have done something stupid to die that you know i mean that must have been why so it's all like she she forgives it which is interesting because they'd had this previously antagonistic relationship but now it's it's not as bad and um so she's there to take him in a cab and she wants to go to europe to to meet with uh raylene kawahara and so he he does he goes with her because um, he doesn't really have any choice, and he gets in this cab with her and goes to meet with Raylene Kawahara, who uh, we find out is someone who originally sent Cadmans to bring him in. Like when Cadmans came to the Hendrix the first time to bring him in, she was the one who uh, also like orchestrated him being sent to Earth in the first place for Bancroft and like all this yeah. stuff. She's very tied up. She like this. recommended that Bancroft pull him out of the stack. So she they have a history together. Yeah, and so she's a meth. Um, she even claims to be one of the seven most powerful humans in the system, which is pretty interesting. Because I'm like, okay, so it's you, is Miriam Bancroft and Lorenz Bancroft? Are they are they two of the seven, or are they not? Do they not even qualify? I don't know. You know, I was, yeah. I was interested by. That. I'm like, who are they? So that might that's probably future book stuff that they talk. They might get into more of that. I guess she had been like really powerful or something on on his old planet, or somehow he knew her in his dealings. And then, and he like detests her. He can't stand her, and she does like awful things. And he he like has reactions like he wants to kill her whenever he's like talking to her. Yeah. Well, one of the things that she reveals is that she has Sarah, basically in storage, which is the woman who he was with at the very beginning, 
and possibly you know has some sort of romantic relationship with right he she threatens she wants him to end the investigation and she threatens to have sarah put into virtual interrogation and basically until she's driven insane um to test out like all these new interrogation techniques and like all this stuff like really dark and that's when he is just like really wants to kill her. He even threatens to kill her, but she kind of laughs it off because, you know, it's impossible. But first off, she, you know, she's like um, Lawrence and Bancroft and that she has these backups that will activate if she were to die and like all this stuff. So she's basically unkillable. And she, she, um, she says she chose him because she wants him to convince Lor- Lorenz Bancroft that he killed himself. And that's actually um, why she, she, uh, she chose him in the first place. Also, she reveals that she got him out of the Y clinic, um, that his like thing about being an envoy was only part of it. Like it, it actually was her stepping in and saying, you need to release him. Um, and then he just like decided to kill everybody, I guess. So basically very quickly, we learned that she's like this puppet master who has been controlling a lot of yeah. the goings on of the plot so far. Um, and when when he goes to Europe, this the, the way they described Europe was kind of how I saw the the upper class in Blade Runner. Like that's kind of what I was imagining, like the people who were living in pyramids and stuff. Like that's kind of what I assumed mm. that she was. How her whole situation was. Yeah. This. Uh, so so after this, he's devastated, and he um he just wants to like disconnect and just like he gets basically goes out on the town with trap and she she this is interesting because they kind of bond in this evening here and they go they want to go on a night on the town and she takes them to all these different like bars and nightclubs and they take this drug called tetrameth and they he, like he gets all fucked up and um, he starts having like visions of jimmy DeSoto, his old fr- war friend who's dead and he's like talking to him and and all this stuff and and he thinks he thinks about how humans have made heaven and hell um, which I think is a really cool idea. Like, you know, if you're not a religious person, then yes, like heaven and hell don't exist. It's it's just this like idea. But through this technology, people have created heaven and hell. You know what I mean? Like you, you've created the ability and like hell is essentially what Sarah is being threatened with. You know, our concept of hell, right? Eternal like suffering and torture. They can literally do that to you. They can put you in a program that will torture you forever your consciousness and you will never escape it so like hell has become a real thing and people made it which i think is a pretty interesting concept in and of itself pretty scary (laughs) that's definitely the uh, dark side to the technology that's coming up in the future i mean the other thing i wanted to talk about with the technology on the other side of that is it's how if your sleeve is only you know if you have a certain enough wealth to where you can transfer sleeves your body is so unimportant now, right? Like the only thing that matters is your personality and your like intelligence, right? Because that's the thing that transfers with you essentially. So if that like, so that's interesting too, because it, that would change society, right? Like if, if it would become, it would become almost worthless to have this like great looking body because that's like anybody can have that. Right. Unless you were in the unless you were extremely rich and then you wanted to like that's it's almost like like a fancy car or like a nice like exactly. piece of jewelry like now. it becomes more of like an accessory yeah. than than anything. Yeah. And like all that really matters is your intelligence and like what you can manip- you know, who you can manipulate. And like that's why these maths are so dangerous because they've proven to be like the best at this in the world. And that's why they're still alive. Yeah. While they're out on the town, he, he and he and uh, Trep really kind of bond and that's important for later and uh after this they go back to bay city he meets with ortega um we find out in this uh this ship which we find out is uh rikers like a ship that riker got he doesn't know that immediately though and while she's in there she is up super furious with him and she's found out that he slept with miriam bancroft she has gotten the like memory from the hendrix hotel and has like seen the video of him doing it um and she like slaps him and she's super mad but then okay this this moment is a little bit tropey um because essentially she's furious with him she's slapping him and then all of a sudden they like realize that this is all because they're super attracted to each other and then boom they have sex right you know what i mean like it, it's that kind of like i'm mad at you i'm mad at me i'm mad at you and then now we're having sex <laughs> now we're fucking yeah um <laughs> it's it's like that 
I mean, like, they have proven that love and hate are, like, extreme emotions that do have, like, an, you know, an overlap. So I think that's where this trope comes from. Right. But it is a bit tropey. Yeah. Um, like I said, I didn't really see it coming. I, I kind of saw that there was, like, tension there or whatever. But I thought that she was just pining over the got Riker and, like, realized, like, I yeah. thought she could separate the fact that, like, this isn't Riker. But I guess she comes to, like, Kovach on his own. But the fact that he's in Riker's body also, like, muddies the waters a little bit for her. I don't know yeah it's well and we don't really know like were her and Riker like officially like going out were they you know like a re- in a relationship or was it just that they were like well she keeps yeah yeah that, that is true but she keeps telling him like protect that body i want that body back and da, da, da. like you know that she cares about him like more than like just like a normal partner would i guess my question is is she cheating on Riker here so we'd have to know more about what their relationship really was, I guess, to really say. We do get something at the end where, like, this whole thing that happens between them, only, like, one or two people know, and he, like, reassures her about that, and then she's like, I know. Yeah, and she's not going to tell Riker is the implication, yeah. too. So, it, it, you know, if that's the case, then it feels like maybe it was cheating, because otherwise, why would you, Why do you feel guilty about right. it? Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a moment where I think we, like... Kovach, so we're like we kind of on his side but also like it feels like kind of a shitty thing to do well yeah it definitely is and it but it's like also like i said it's like that updated noir thing like this is the character yeah. that, that they're like it's somebody dealing with being in the lowest the lowest of the low and the highest of that like as far as people go like the people who are in the underbelly and the people who are high society and then like navigating in between that being the the good guy in the story but also being like not yeah. like the best morals and yeah that's, that's just this character exactly all it's fl- he's flawed right? right and he's yeah he's he's a slave to his own biological desires and all this stuff yeah he's not he's not this paragon you know what i mean like he might be in a different story in this story he's willing to do this anyway so they they fuck uh, really graphically again um but that's that's how this book is you know it's 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 adult, it's adult. that's all it is so the next morning, he uh, tells Ortega everything about what happened with uh, Kawahara and how she wants him to kill the case. And he he's agreed to do this, by the way. He he is he he's trapped, and he cares too much about Sarah, which is another like is he cheating on Sarah? <laughs> um, but another thing where uh, he he wants to save Sarah from this hell fate that's worse than death. And in order to do that, he has to kill the case. And so he's agreed to do this. But he really, when he's talking to Ortega, um, Ortega really wants to like find a way to arrest Kawahara for her involvement and the illegal dealings and all this stuff. But you know, he points out like there's no way we can do it. Like it, she's too powerful. She's basically a god, and you know, there's nothing he can really do about it. So they agree that he's going to try and kill the case. So somewhere in here, he does have an idea, though. He starts to have an idea. And it seems like he doesn't maybe have it fully fleshed out, but he has this idea for, like, how he can kill the case with Bancroft, at least, and convince him that he killed himself. And maybe also he, she's going to do something else. We, we start not getting every piece of, like, what he's, like, the information he's operating under, just to mm-hmm. keep it, like, as a surprise. Um, so he calls, he, got, he calls Kamahara, and he asks her, Kawahara, and he asks her for a copy of the virus from Inanin that destroyed Jimmy DeSoto's stack. So we know that there was this like virus that infects people's stacks and it makes it so their mem- like their consciousness is not recoverable and it inflicts the real death essentially, right? And he wants a copy of this stack because he's going to use it to convince Bancroft. Um, and she she ends up agreeing. Uh, and then one of his other conditions is that he wants her to get Irene Elliott out of storage and uh so that he can use her to to you know in this in this plan and she agrees to do that too so he goes to pick up the virus that he gets uh sent over from uh kalahara and then while he's there he also goes and gets irene elliott out of the stack and she's in this different sleeve now and totally confused doesn't know why she's been released and he explains to her that you know he's a friend or whatever but she's like really skeptical of him and he has this plan that he tells her that he doesn't necessarily tell all of it to us. And part of it is she gets to go see her husband. So he brings her back to see her husband and she goes inside with him and has this night with him. And uh, he just waits out in the car. And while he's waiting in the car, Trep shows up. Um, apparently she's been like tailing him and watching his back. 
And so they have coffee. And this is another moment of them kind of bonding a little bit, which I think is also important for later. Um, and she kind of finds like she's asking him why, you know, why he did this for Irene Elliott and all this stuff. And um, he doesn't really know why. Like he kind of says, you know, I don't know. I just it's just something I wanted to do. Um, you know, it seems to be just kind of like he has a soft spot for this for this family and what happened to them. So the next day, uh, you know, Irene Elliott's ready to help now. And she mentions how it was weird because it felt like her husband was like cheating on her or being unfaithful for having sex with her and her new body, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> which I think is also like a funny like, is that cheating? I don't know. Like, exactly. Yeah. There's so many things in this, thing, right? in this like world here that like y- you just like I feel like would have to be accustomed to because yeah. of the way that it all works at that point. So I thought it was interesting that she was like, she, even though it was her, she was like, how, what are you doing? <laughs> well, she says that like, she, 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 she felt that way, but like knew it was like, she didn't like act on it, but yeah. she, she did feel that way. Right. Um, so now Kovach goes to tell Bancroft and he, when he goes to tell him, he has this footage that Irene Elliott has faked that shows him going into this like really seedy establishment. And what his plan is to tell Bancroft that he was infected by this virus that he would have known was going to get uploaded back to his all of his copies and stuff during the his like automated needle cast. And so the the you know, his theory is that Bancroft killed himself. His story, I should say, is that Bancroft killed himself in order to prevent that from happening. And this is a good, I mean, this is a good, like, I buy it, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a good thing to convince. I think it does, and it does convince Bancroft here. He believes it. He's like, oh, it's so simple. I should have, I should have known. But it's also like his own, like, uh, sins caught up to him too, right? And like, that's how he got infected. And this proof, you know, that he shows him of the video that Irene Elliott put together is like the last little bit to convince him. Yeah, and it's funny because, like, this is, like, Bancroft's character and, like, the kind of the end of, like, his involvement, of kind of, uh, which is interesting because, like, setting up the story early on, like, last week when we were we were first learning about the story, um, he's, like, this big player that we think is always going to be, like, the thing that's, like, overshadowing yeah. his investigation and stuff, and this is kind of it coming to an end, so, like, this is kind of a lot of the things that I thought were going to be happening in this story coming to an end also. So I was just like, okay, so where do we go from here? Yeah. So now he's lied to him, but convinced him that the lie is true. Right. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's weird because it does kind of end the investigation and, 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 um, and all of that now, but while he's there, he, he notices that telescope again. And when he looks at it, he can tell that the dust has been disturbed on it. And, he realizes that this is like a, a detail that he missed last time because mm-hmm. ba- uh, Bancroft had said that he doesn't use it anymore. And so he looks in it and then he sees that the telescope is fixed on this head in the clouds airship, which is a really fancy brothel that he knows about. And that's when he's like starts to have even more things clicking into place. Like he's getting closer. He's getting closer. Um, as he's leaving, he tells Ban- uh, Miriam that he gave her husband an answer, but that it, but that it isn't a real like it isn't a true one. So I thought it was funny that he like tells reveals to her that what he told uh, what he told Lorenz is not true. Yeah, I mean she's gonna tell him eventually, right? It's, I don't think she's gonna hold it from him forever. So I, I mean I don't know. I mean we don't know what the relationship's like, and uh, it's in fact it seems pretty pretty awful. So uh, yeah, who knows if she would ever reveal it? I don't know. But it's a risk. I think telling her is a risk. Yeah. All right. So then he gets a call from Cadman, who the patchwork man, who has Ortega. She's been captured by him. And, you know, he's threatening all kinds of stuff with her. Uh, real death, you know, torture, all this stuff. So he he what he wants to do is exchange Ortega for for uh, Kovach. And Kovach is like, OK, we're going to do this. So he goes outside to meet him. And Ortega gets kind of pushed out of a car and then Cadman gets him, has him come inside the car. And then when he's inside he, in the car, he gets stunned and knocked out. All right. So next thing happens is he wakes up and uh, he thinks that Kawahara, after he lied to to Lorenz Bancroft, must have sold him out. And like she and he thinks like she has this old world honor where she is gonna like re- release sarah but that 
he wasn't part of that bargain so because, so that he's expendable now so essentially she told Cadman's where where he was and let like let him loose on him and so what 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 Cadman has done is set up this um fight that's going to happen with in the ring the killing floor and like all this stuff that we talked about earlier um and he's going to be there and he's going to have to fight in this humiliation bout against Cadman who's got this like otherworldly power you know power and, and, and abilities and he's in this great body and all this stuff this really awesome sleeve and uh you know rikers and or uh kovach is in rikers body and so they, they they're gonna fight and um you know he's gonna be way way outmatched and so we yeah we get this like in the middle of a big ring fight with like all these people cheering and it's a cool scene yeah it kind of reminded me of like i mean it's obviously like akin to like a boxing match or like a like a gladiatorial they're like watching all this stuff but it kind of reminded me of like that fight from sherlock holmes with robert downey jr and Mm -hmm. i imagine um cadman being sherlock holmes and like analyzing because he had like a crazy he had abilities where he was like clearly faster clearly he was thinking like he was a step ahead of him almost the whole fight well and he also had these like power knuckles on that could deliver this like really devastating blow yeah every now and then Mm mm-hmm um, so yeah, it was like, it, you know, he, he puts up a great, like, you know what I mean? His envoy training, like he gets some good blows in. he puts up a fight, but he ends up getting the shit beat out of him. But then, and right. Yeah. Right. When he's near death, uh, Trep and Batista and some police show up and, but yeah, what really cool is like Trep actually comes down from like the sky, like for the skylight or something like lowers down in with this big rifle and she's just, she obliterates, um, Cadman. I guess he just gets torn like blown apart and then she just blasts like she starts shooting people in the crowd and stuff which i was like what the um, hell are you doing she's just killing everybody yeah yeah and it's like it's just called like biological damage she's dealing all this biological damage she's just killing um, everyone all these people the all these people can like resleeve i guess is the theory yeah they're probably all crooks anyway but it's just like still yeah she was ki- she was just like just unloading on everyone and then, um, yeah, then the police are there, and so he gets rescued. And uh, at the end, after he's rescued, he uh, Kobach uh, RDs Cadman, which was real death. Like, he he executes him, essentially. Um, and I think it's, like, for real, but I also don't know for certain. I wouldn't be shocked if, like, somehow Cadman's came back in a future book or something. But this yeah. is the last we see of him in this book. We theoretically really dead. Yeah, I like that scene a lot, actually. That was the one that, like, I, I can't wait to see that in the show. I will say that. Yeah. That'd be yeah. A cool and one. I think there is a trailer that shows a little bit of them in a ring. Nice. So unfortunately it was a little bit spoiled for me because I knew something about it, but um, I do think this is going to happen in the show. Yeah. Something like this. Uh, so this is when Ortega visits um, Kovach in the like tank room at this, sh- at the, at the Panama Rose. And they're talking about like how they're going to kind of cover up what happened here. Cause they have to like, this wasn't legal and they have to, come up with a story about like what happened and then he's sitting there and he's thinking and it seems like he's still over going over the stuff in his head and he's figuring these things out and he's coming up with this plan he decides that he wants to like go after kawahara and he has this plan to do it he's like i can get kawahara and i can get Riker cleared and all this stuff and he's come, come up with this plan we don't know exactly what it entails um and he needs irene elliott to help you know uh help cover up what happened here with the police at least so he ends up calling Miriam Bancroft next and he has this it's funny too because he has this we have this moment where he's in the hotel room okay this is a wild scene and we think that he's having this he has like early on he has this separation from body where he feels like an out of body experience where he's watching himself do things right but it's actually just this like psychological phenomenon that happens when you get put in a new sleeve and so we think that's what's happening because he's watching and he even refers to him as he like I watched him pick up the phone and call Miriam Bancroft and all this stuff. But come to find out what's happened is he's, is he's got a copy of himself. And this is a really kind of mind blowing scene because he, he has this he's sitting in a hotel room with himself um, and he has this conversation and it's really cool. This is this is a, another like I mean, I feel like we can from here to the end of the of the story is like all stuff that I'm really excited to see in the show. But like yeah. this will be great because it's like th- and this opens up again a whole other can of worms because we were just dealing with s- people in sleeves and we had heard that there were multiple people like there was like the same person in multiple sleeves at the same time. But we've gone yeah. full on like it's it's like two 
two two Kovaches inside of two Riker sleeves, right? No, uh, one is the Riker sleeve and one is the Tech Ninja body. Oh yeah, you're right. Back yeah. at the that he got from the the Panama Rose, which yeah. is this like supremely high end, top of the line biotech ninja body. Which is sweet. This is another thing I can't wait to see in the in the show. Yeah, yeah. So he's in that body, and then like the original um, Kovach is it still on the Riker sleeve? Yeah, and the conversation. And we're in the have. point. Of, we've swapped POVs, and we're actually in the new. I believe for this scene, we're in the new body. Like we're in the the tech ninja body that we're in his point of view, and he's watching himself do things, and it's just like this weird moment. Um, and they have this conversation with each other. And they talk about how for their plan to work, one of them is going to go to head in the clouds and like infiltrate it. And the other one is going to go with Miriam Bancroft to her like pleasure island to have sex with all of the copies of her. And that's like the plan, I guess, because they have to distract her and they have to like get her out of the out of the um, out of the equation. They kind of talk about after this is all said and done, there can't be two Kovaches. So they're like, yeah, we have to decide. To we have to decide who's going to be destroyed and whose consciousness will carry on. And then eventually it like boils down to a game of, of Rochambeau, little rock, paper, scissors. Yeah. I mean, that's what it ends up being. But yeah, in this moment, they're like, we'll have to figure it out later because, you know, like they both of us are going to want to survive. And they mention stuff. a couple different ways that they could decide it, like if they wanted to gamble or this or that. And like, yeah. And then they also say like, well, if neither if like one of us doesn't survive then it's going to be a foregone conclusion <laughs> yeah um but so one of the things that comes up in this conversation that i want to talk to you about is he says how long does it take before we're no longer the same person and i thought that's a really interesting question cuz like if you have an exact copy of yourself made you know let's say uh, you know right now exact copy of yourself boom made and one of you stays home while the other one goes out and does and like runs some errands. That person is now having an experience that you don't have. Yeah. They, whatever happens to them while they're out getting groceries is something that you never experience. Are they now a different person than you? Yeah. Even though they were once identical. I think so. Yeah. I think as soon as so you, you're essentially immediately. Yeah. Almost like even like as soon as you're not having the exact same experience in the same room you know what i mean even if he's sitting in yeah. another chair he's having the experience yeah. of sitting in that chair you don't have that experience so like you're yeah. almost immediate i think in my opinion you're almost immediately different a different person yeah so you're no longer identical just at, right off the jump now yeah. you're still like they say like most of your personality and most of your identity is based off of like your memories and they share all the same memories so in that sense they are the same person they're like a based it's almost like they're a person who's based off the same person right if that makes any sense but as soon as they make new memories then they're not the same anymore yeah so this gets like really it's like really weird to think about it's also interesting too because they talk about here about how um the one in the new body is like what you know what's going on with uh ortega like why are we doing you know, like why are we dealing with her and like you know why are, what are we going to do in the future and the one in the Riker sleeve is like, well, now you're in a different body, so you don't feel the same way as I do about her because a lot of it's tied up in this body. So that that was interesting too. You know, that's we talked a little bit about that earlier. I also wanted to say they they uh, there's this cool thing about about whiskey, like, and you know, I'm a big whiskey guy, and he they like, keep drinking single malts, and uh, he says at one point, um, something I think it's something Jimmy DeSoto used to say. He says, any more than five fingers, and you might as well be drinking a blend. Which this is another moment of like this book is meant for me <laughs> because like most people have no idea what the fuck that's even talking about. But this is such like a deep cut whiskey thing that I love. Um, it's just talking about how like single malts have like this really unique characteristic and blends tend to homogenize the flavor um, in a way that makes it less memorable. And so he's saying that like if you get certain if you get to a certain level of drunk, like you might as well not be trying to chase this like really unique experience in drinking this single malt anyway like i said it's like a nerdy it's like a whiskey nerd thing and i loved it <laughs> that's awesome yeah i didn't honestly that went over my head i had no idea what, he, what was going on there i thought he meant i thought he'd stuck his fingers in the drink and i was like I'm, you know obviously that's gonna ruin the scotch right or the whiskey oh no no he's talking about measuring like how how much how much is in a glass you ever heard yeah. that like two fingers three fingers whatever no but now yeah. i have so yeah that's like yeah if if, if you if uh you know if you don't want to say like pour me a shot 
you can say like pour me two fingers worth of and that's how much you fill the glass gotcha to match that height and he says five fingers is basically a whole hand any more than that and you might as well be drinking a blend <laughs> anyway uh, that's funny so um so i so they let's just let's just, let's just get to it they th- this goes on to the in the invasion and we're in Kovach's body in the air like airship as it's approaching head in the clouds and he's with Ortega and he's with Batista and a few other people and he like gets ejected in this stealth parachute suit thing and he like stealthily gets loaded into um into head in the clouds he's got taken this drug that lowers his body temperature so that he won't set off any of the sensors and he's in this ninja body so he's able to like I don't know, like sneak around and be just be really crafty. This is the body, by the way. This is the sleeve that I would decide to be in. If I was given any choice, I'd be in a ninja sleeve for <laughs> sure. Yeah. Pretty cool. So, uh, and as he's there, they he actually encounters them and they walk right past him and he has to like hide and there's all this stuff. Um, he does have this uh, really dark thing where he finds this like important guy who doesn't know who he is, who's like, apparently been fucking dogs or something and oh i did not catch he, that that i did not catch that at all i didn't know you didn't no i didn't yeah, that's, realize that's that the implication jesus yeah that's the implication of what happened and he executes that guy yeah fuck he deserves to be executed that's insane dude yeah that's what that's what he's been doing so this is the implication is that like really dark shit goes down in this place i didn't realize that there, I, that was wild I, that went right over my head i guess just the, listening to it i missed it or something i don't know yeah I think I think that's what was it was it was it wasn't like directly said it was all like implied but yeah that was what I gathered wow so this guy was into some sort of bestiality thing that was like his thing and he was doing it at this place and so it's another you know like there <laughs> Richard K Morgan does a good job of making us hate you know Kawahara and like this establishment and everything that goes on here because of this stuff right and the whole thing is that they're they're investigating that like there's been snuff sex going on here where people are murdering people um and that's like you know and if you murder a catholic then they can't be received and so that's a way to like hide what you did because snuff is illegal like it's interesting because it's like not illegal in virtual reality but it is illegal in like regular reality anyway um so he is able to ke- sneak into Kawahara's rooms and room and confronts her and this is a this is another just really cool like climactic scene right like they're exchanging barbs and um he tells her that he's infected her he dipped her last needle cast uh with irene elliott and they were able to infect all of her backups with this virus so she's basically so all of a sudden now. She, she's now mortal and she's faced with the reality that she can't if she were to if she gets you know if she dies now she can't come back yeah and he's got her cornered and he's like gonna kill her basically unless he gets all the answers he wants yeah and so yeah they have this conversation and then this is where like everything is kind of revealed um i guess what happened and so so the original question is what happened to lorenz bancroft why did he die and we finally find out here what actually happened. So what actually happened, uh, although we we only get a part of it, I guess. We get a little bit more from Miriam later. But so what happened was Bancroft came to this establishment, to the Head in the Clouds, and to have sex with a girl that he, and this is something apparently that he does sometimes. And he has the whore that he has sex with, uh, the prostitute, whatever, um, made to look like his wife or he selects one that ma- looks like his wife. I'm not really sure. And he like has sex with her and then he kills her in this like snuff encounter. He strangles her to death. And the reason being that it's like, he really wants to kill his wife, but he can't cause she's this meth. Right. Or that's like his fantasy is like killing her. And that this, it's really dark about like their marriage and like how, what it's descended to over time. Right. Yeah. And but what 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 he, what he does he does this to a person but then they resleeve so he doesn't actually kill them and we find out about Lorenz is that he has this like weird sense of like honor and stuff like he's not completely m- without morals and without scruples even though we're hearing about him doing this terrible thing right the person that he does it to gets to be resleeved is his like one thing that he like hangs his hat on 
And like he still feels guilty about it and everything. But but what happens is the person he kills is a Catholic. And when he finds that out, he like loses it because he's like he has really killed them. Then right, they're so not you know from the sleep. story that we talked about it last week mostly that within within the confines of this Catholicism and people who are Catholic um, can't be brought back because they think that the soul is is going to stay behind with the 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 yeah like they they don't that, believe in the stack thing like they basically think that you know. The human, yeah, that you don't transfer, so they don't want it. They don't. They think if you're dead, you don't ever transfer. So she can't and come back the, after he kills her. She can't come back. Kawahara is really. It's, so there's all tied up also in this like um, proposition that they're trying to pass, and she wants Lorenz to like back, back her, which is like trying not to get it to pass, right? Then yeah, the 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 ruling or the law that they're trying to get imposed is basically they want to be able to bring catholics back temporarily in order to ask them how they were murdered and get interviews and stuff to put people on trial for that and then like uh, i think they would let them die again so yeah all this stuff is tied up in that proposition somehow and what happens is bancroft ends up killing himself over with guilt Uh, we find out later that miriam um spiked spiked his body with this drug that makes you more likely to like kill yourself um makes you depressed i think and uh she also orchestrated to have the whore or the prostitute that he had sex with be uh, a catholic like so this is all something she did um which is kind of fucked up because that means that she knew all of this for like the whole time the, uh, during the investigation yeah. so, so she ultimately it is the wife i guess yeah that's what that's right, what we mean with like it. all the all the turns and twists and red herrings because she was effectively a red herring red herring so she was like supposed to throw us off the trail but in the end it was it was her indirectly that kind of had a lot of the th- things going on it like was he did kill himself but she orchestrated a situation that she knew would drive him to do it kind of thing with the help of kawahara yeah. So it's like on both yeah, of them all, and it's all tied up in this this mystery. It was pretty compelling. Like I liked it the full way through. It was it was I, I didn't feel like there was anything that he didn't really cover. Like he hit all the bases and, and kept us guessing. So two things I want to say about about the mystery, I guess, and they're related. Um the mystery itself is and this is the so the the reason I kicked myself for not seeing this coming more is that the mystery of why Bancroft died, we were thinking of it like in normal world reasons, right? Someone killed him for this reason. Like we never got around to like why someone would kill him, even though they knew he was going to get uploaded. Right. And the reason being this smartly, I think this mystery can only happen in this world. And I think a good mystery that is often the case And especially in a mystery in a world where there's different rules. And so what's great about this mystery is this mystery could only play out in this altered carbon universe with these rules because it involves, you know, Catholics not being able to be revived and him wanting to kill people. And then like the automatic uh, the needle cast, the way that he's even alive still is because of the backups and like all this stuff is all tied up in this world. Right. And that's what makes this like the perfect answer. And you know, even if I hadn't been able to predict the exact reasons, because it would have been really hard to do that at the midway point, um, I should have seen more of like that the reasons behind it are going to be tied directly to the world we're in, because that just makes a lot of narrative sense. Um, so, yeah, by the way, I predicted that it was going to have something to do with the daughter who is never even mentioned again. So yeah. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty wrong. About when you that. when you said that, it <laughs> felt really right when you said that last week so i was waiting for the the daughter to show up i was like she's coming i know it i was like here she comes <laughs> nope never even mentioned again so dead wrong <laughs> um anyway so let's get back to the kamahara thing because this is re- re- really interesting kamahara he um she gets the best of him calls in trap well she calls in trap and trap blasts him with the stun gun and knocks him out and uh at this point like he's gonna die and um but what's interesting is he should be knocked out but because he's in this like special ninja tech body or whatever he doesn't actually he isn't actually unconscious he's like right at the edge and he's paralyzed and he's kind of watching this uh, you know story kind of play out 
And Trep doesn't know it's him because she doesn't recognize this body, right? And she comes in and she has to be told by Kawahara, oh yeah, this is Kovach. And she kind of goes like, oh, like, you know, this is this person who I've been hanging out with and have kind of become friends with and I rescued not that long ago. She tur- she turns a little bit in this moment. And it's funny because it doesn't take much, but what happens is he starts to wake up. Like he starts to blink and she pretends like she doesn't see it. And that's like the main thing that she does to protect him, right? Yeah, and then I mean, she soon he starts to to will himself to move his body parts, and he's starting to, because because Carl Hall is just like monologuing and like talking to talking yeah. to whoever and calling security and all this stuff. In the meantime, he's like, because she thinks he's like out cold, so he's like yeah. starting to like will himself back to life, basically, so he can move around and stuff. And right when he's like getting to the point where he can move around, Trep like goes for her guns her stun guns and whatever she has on her to, to try to, to she's betraying Kawahara and but Kawahara's got yeah, all these. So in- Kawahara comes over and like, she's going to um, remove the thing in his, like his, uh, this thing under his eye that like records has been recording their conversation. And he revealed to her that he had this. And so she comes over with a pair of like needle nose pliers to just like get that shit out. And um, she goes to stab him. And then like at the last second he moves and it just like scrapes, scrapes into his face. And then he, yeah, he punches her and like he starts to struggle with her. And then, yeah, she realizes that Trep has betrayed her and she, you know, shoots Trep with a, like with two guns. It's like the stun gun and um, Kovach's gun. And we don't know what her status is. We just know that she goes down. Um, and then, you know, at the end, it's revealed that she doesn't die. But, you know, in this moment, we don't know. Um, and then, uh, yeah, they have this like fight. She beats the shit out of him some more and gets the best of him. And then she like actually stabs the, the, uh, pliers into his eye socket, which is this like really gross scene where you can like see it sticking out of his, like of his other eye socket. Yeah. He talks about how it goes from like, like he can see the pliers coming at his eye and then it squishes his eye and he sees like red and then it like turns to black to where like he loses sight in the eye. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah. It's, it's brutal. Yeah. And so at some point during the struggle, he like grabs something and we don't know what, and this becomes very important. (laughs) Um, And uh, so right when she's about to basically kill him, he ha- he's got these micro grenades that we do here just like as a throwaway thing that he grabs as part of his arsenal when he's like getting all ready is these micro grenades and he's got two of them and he p- has one in his hand and he like puts it on the glass that they're on and he blows through the glass and you know they struggle a little bit but it ends up the glass shatters and they fall through the and he like wraps his legs around her so that she can't escape from him like she's he's holding her tight and then she's still like stabbing him with the like thing repeatedly but he, he's just got her now and so he blasts through the glass and he falls and they fall from this like city in the clouds thing and as they're falling and plummeting towards the earth he has his other hand that has this other micro grenade and he like puts it to her neck and blasts her cortical stack like give, inflicting the real death on her as they fall which is that's really yeah. kind of epic conclusion. If, if this, we see that, if we see the scene play out how I'm imagining it, like I'm so excited for the scene. And what's crazy is that like he effectively, I mean, obviously he's falling forever and no, nothing's going to catch him or stop him or anything. So like he's he's going to die. Gonna, I guess he's going to land in the ocean is what I, the implication. And but what he yeah. does is like when he when he like puts his hand to the back of her neck, he like pulls her 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 neck like close to his stomach and like blows a, blows a hole in his stomach as well, kind of. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So we kind of like I kind of was like, oh, he's fucking dead here. Right. And so the the last twist is so we get this final scene, this epilogue scene where he's going to the Bancroft residence to talk to Miriam and he shows up and um, I think he's yeah, he's in Riker's body and we're like, OK, so this is the non like we thought the Tech Ninja one did all the cool shit and then died. But then, so while he's there, she like makes this reference to like, oh, you know, we had this fun doing something. And like, he's like, I don't remember any of that. And she's like, what the fuck? And like, come to find out the tech ninja who killed Kawahara and everything is the one whose consciousness is now in Riker's body. And the original who went to Pleasure Island with uh, (laughs) Miriam Bancroft, he's dead. And so we get the story of what happened. And that's that they, they met in this like virtual construct afterwards to like discuss who was going to survive 
Um, cause they fished him out of the water, I guess the, you know, the other one, his consciousness and, um, they discuss it and they decide to do rock, paper, scissors to see who, <laughs> to see who gets to live on and who's going to get destroyed. And it's interesting because he says that he feels like the other him somehow through the game, but he doesn't know how it would be possible. Yeah. Which also then I, I went down this rabbit hole of like, if I was playing rock, paper, scissors against myself, would you know, how do I not throw the same thing every time? Like that shows like the difference between who you are, right? Like that shows the differences and that you're going to throw different things. And if I wanted to throw the game, how would I even do that? Like, would I try and predict what I was going to throw and then like, yeah subvert it in some way like it's it was wild. definitely really cool and and the implication is like we still get that the hero walking off into the sunset um or like dying sacrificing himself because the the character that we had for the entire book is gone and yeah. died in the struggle yeah, he, at the end of the here. movie or at the end of the story yeah. effectively and he says something like you know yeah uh, you know maybe you know he says like maybe go go talk to jimmy DeSoto or something so like he, and it seems like he kind of is resigned to it like he's kind of happy with what happened yeah he it. like walks out happy and smiles and doesn't look back kind of and shuts the door the virtual door yeah and we do find out that one of the last his one of his last requests is that they don't that he, that the evidence against miriam bancroft doesn't come to light and so marion bancroft isn't going to like go to prison or whatever for what she did and they just basically destroy the evidence um and that's interesting too because i wanted to ask you like why do you think he does that why do you think he spares her this like retribution for what she did i don't know maybe it has something to do with the fact that like he feels like what what bancroft his on his own what he does and like the resentment he has for his wife like maybe it's just like he, maybe he's thinking as a meth and maybe he's like gotten to the point where he's like he's like kind of understanding of why she would do the the things that she did to, in order to kill her husband because at the end of the day like her husband is still there he's not actually dead and yeah. i don't know it's like at, at like what yeah. point are you on her side for him like straight like wanting to kill her basically and like that's where the relationship is at and it's just like a sad existence kind of yeah and he says like you know you deserve each other that kind of thing but but he, the real reason he did it is because the other him asked him to. Right. And he even says that. Like, that's the. And, and what I like about it is, to me, it hints at a story that we didn't get. And that's what happened at Pleasure Island, essentially. And I'm not just talking about the, you know, crazy sex they undoubtedly had. I'm talking about, like, a, I, you would think that something happened there where she revealed maybe backstory and like what their relationships like and and somewhere in there he know he found out her true story and he took pity on her i think yeah. and 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 he feels like she's a victim i guess in some way enough to where he spares her what happens at the end but we don't actually get that story in this book is what's really cool like it don't it like it happens off page like because yeah. we don't get what happened there and i mean i think ever. that's smart because like in a story like i feel like you definitely want there to be some loose ends to where it's like you don't know everything but we can apply some stuff and i, I think that's smart because it just feels like a bigger world that he's written okay so the actual final final scene we get is him going in riker's body with Kristen ortega to the place where he's going to be he's going to take a needle cast to go back to harlan's world is what i think is happening and he kind of has this moment where they talk to each other and you mentioned how he says you know no one knows about what happened between us so it doesn't need to you know doesn't need to go anywhere from here and there's like an awkwardness now because she knows she's about to get Riker back because he's going to vacate the sleeve and then Riker's going to be um, freed from imprisonment because he's been cleared of being framed because he was framed by Kawahara. I don't know if we made that clear or not. <laughs> there's so many little twists and turns in this story. Riker got framed by Kawahara for investigating the Catholic girl's death and she he was getting too close to the truth and so she had him framed to get him put away. <laughs> I don't know if we made that clear. <laughs> anyway, um so, you know, it's it's amazing because, like, all this crazy stuff, but, like, in the end, like, you know, people get justice, uh, Riker's going to be restored to his body, and, you know, the Irene, oh, yeah, he also, I should also say, the other big thing, um, at the end, he, uh, Elizabeth Elliot, Irene Elliot's daughter, has been given to them, and she's in this, like, virtual condo while they are trying to raise money to get her a new sleeve. And that's, you know, you know, the other prostitute who died a long time ago, right? Um, at Jerry's. Kobach is going to donate the money he earned from doing this. 
he's going to donate it to their family. I think it's like 80,000 of the full hundred or something. I don't, yeah. I don't really know. Um, so basically he does the, there, and that's like the good guy thing. And at the end of the day, he does the, the nice thing and gives them the money to get her back. And, and it's like a ton of money. So she's going to be able to get, to get like a sleeve of her choice. And, and he's going to reunite this family who was torn apart by the maths and like all this crazy shit. And it, the, his reasoning for doing that is that he, he says he wanted to have something clean come out of this. And that's kind of the last thought we're left with. He kind of says goodbye to Ortega. And then he goes and he takes the needle, needle cast and he's like zoomed away and he leaves this body, Riker's body. And that's the end of the novel with him thinking about how he wanted there to be something clean. And he kind of smiles at the end or he's like trying to laugh as he get, takes this needle cast. So it ends on this kind of oddly positive note. Yeah, which I thought was um, interesting. And I, wanted I to, thought that the whole... Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. I thought that the whole ending clean thing was like, I, I feel like... Most of the time in the in the noirs that I feel like this this book is referencing kind of uh, or like the cyber book, I feel like it's usually not always, but there's definitely like a certain amount of happiness at the end of like a noir. And I feel like he just leaned into that. Like there's two there's really like two ways you can end it. Right. It's just like he dies a hero or whatever and he doesn't come back and he doesn't donate the money or he's just uh, like it ends happily. And I feel like. I don't know. It's a nice ending. I thought it was cool. Like mostly I'm I'm the kind of person who would normally want to want to like see like oh I want to see everybody s- stretch to the max and have this really impactful story. And that's really what it was and like oh how crazy would it have been if he did if he did die there and what a hero he would have been. But I think it was cool and like I was going to say I think that it's cool that this this series carries on and it's almost like an anthology of this guy who or I'm, I'm assuming it would be cool to see like an anthology of this guy doing different ca- being on different cases or dealing with different mysteries. Yeah. Um, we, yeah, we should talk about that. Cause like, I think that's something that it, we must be heading like, cause my original thought was, Oh, we'll, we'll have season one, season two different books. But I have a feeling that if that's, I mean, we still could happen, but it would be an anthology because he like almost nothing here. I have a feeling is going to be, very important in book two or only like reference right. you know what i mean like a lot of these characters are left behind on earth yeah right? probably just reference unless he comes and then his back character earth, but... like his name and like his yeah it's just kovach and he's going to be in it, like so it would be a different actor it would be you know all kinds of stuff right Pretty cool i'm looking forward to that yeah so that that is cool um and i think the ending clean stuff is also kind of an interesting kind of optimistic note to end this book on and the whole book has a lot of it has been about like the depravity and the like darkest reaches of you know the human mind and you know our desires and 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 our faults and all this stuff and to end where he feels like he wanted something clean and he wanted something like pure it's it highlights how there's also this capacity for good and for you know virtue in us and we're not just these like animals who are you know slaves to our baser instincts yeah and so it's kind of a nice like more optimistic note on a book that is otherwise really dark (laughs) yeah Yeah, i do like that as well because it's like it's like even after all that stuff i think it's a a telling message that after all of the things that can happen to you and all the things that go on and all the the bad things that happen at the end of the day like the good can still outshine because that's the thing we're left with. It can kind of outshine all of those things. If you just kind of, I guess, revel in it or like, or like, or or like realize that it's happening or, or at least strive for it because that's what he was doing at the end was he was striving for something happy, something good. So, and he, he got it by, by, he knows that he's left that family better, better off than they were when he was there before he got there. Yeah, and he's also re- reunited Kristen Ortega, which he had feelings for, but like, you know, whatever you want to say about what they did, like, at the very least, he is reuniting her with, you know, the love, uh, you know, that she lost, and so he can feel good about that, too, I think. Yeah. All right, so I, that's the end of this book. I think the last thing I want to do is talk a little bit about, like, stuff about the series maybe that we're excited for, that we, we where we think it might go, and... um you know, any last thoughts about the book in general, I guess, and then, and then that'll be it. So you have anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned some of the scenes that I'm really looking forward to. I, I watched the trailer a couple times, and I looked into it after I finished the story. And I what from what I can tell, the story is going to follow, the story in the, in the show is going to follow this story fairly closely. So I'm looking forward to that. I think that'll be really cool. Um, it's It does seem the major difference is that um our main character 
is has been like in storage for 200 years and he's going to be a much more like i don't think he's going to understand all the technology yeah, he's going to be like fish out of water more yeah so, i think if they're going to play that up more but I, I i think it looks interesting i'm excited because netflix has a pretty good track record as far as this kind of stuff is concerned so it looks yeah it looks fairly cinematic it looks like it's got some good effects um I really want to see them like go there. Like I want, I don't want them to pull punches in the show. Well, and I was going to say most Netflix shows, like even like their darker, more adult stuff, like um, Mindhunter just came out. Like even then they tend to not really go past a like PG 13. Like yeah. maybe they, they, they use language, but they don't show a lot of sex. They don't show a lot of nudity. Yeah. I would say for most Netflix shows. So I'll be interested to see if this is different or if it falls the same. Like they go, they go close, but like, you know, nipples are kind of blurred out or whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they kind of do. Um, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Um, Cause this, if they were going to do it, this is a story that I think, you know, it would be the time to do it um, to, to, to really take it to that next level. I don't know. Um, I'm excited too. Yeah. I think I, I think his name's like Joel Kinnaman or whatever is the guy who's going to play Kovach or Riker's sleeve or whatever. Um, I kind of have mixed feelings about him as this character, but I like him enough as an actor and some of the other, like I saw the, I saw him the killing and I've seen him in some other stuff. I like him enough to where like, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and yeah. see what he can do with this role. Yeah. And you know, the guy who plays Lorenz Bancroft, like I really like that actor. I think he can be really interesting. So, and it's, I'll be, it'll be really cool to see what they do with that with those characters him and miriam and in, in the show and what you know what they're like but i you know anyway it's just it, we're interested we're excited for the show i think i already talked about how if they're going to do more than one season of this it's going to have to be an anthology and that's something i wanted to point out but yeah i i'm excited to binge it we're going to binge it over the weekend um record next week early and then uh yeah a week from now we will have you will have an episode where we talk about the series as a whole which is going to be another funny thing to try and fit it all into one episode. Yeah. We're going to try. It'll be fun. It'll be an experience. So tune back in next week for that. All right. Before we end here, I wanted to read a bit of uh, feedback we actually got uh, from our uh, to film Gmail account. Um, so Todd wrote in, one of our listeners, and he says, I agree with your take on this book completely. It is right in my wheelhouse also. I love this type of SF, and I bought this book when it came out but for whatever reason i didn't get around to reading it until about a year and a half ago needless to say i loved it and i read all three books in the series this is the best one the others deviate from the mystery setting and become more military-ish or basically just thrillers i was surprised about the depth of the sex scenes though it may be truth or whatever you want to call it but it is also gratuitous and not necessarily needed I have no issue with it personally, but it is definitely a choice he makes, and that kind of puts this book in a different literary category in some aspects. It, ne it certainly is not common in the genre, and it goes against the norms of expectation. I am so psyched about the show on Netflix. So, so he agrees. Like, it's, he basically, he's saying he doesn't, it doesn't really bother him, but he recognizes that this isn't super common in, in science yeah. fiction. Right? Which is cool, because it's like... It's something that before I read his feedback, I hadn't really thought about. Like, the, I'm just kind of used to if I read a story and there's like a sex scene or whatever. Yeah, that PG for 13 version of it. Like, it goes yeah, by that's true. Quick, right. Like, you, you don't, don't get, get as gratuitous. You don't get the play by play. But specifically like here, in yeah. sci-fi, like he's saying, like, I, I don't I can't recall yeah. many sex scenes in sci-fi novels that I've read. Well, and I, in, in, in defense of the sex scenes in here, like, I mean, yes, it's very t tied up in what happens in these in this that's book. True. And like. Every time he has sex with someone, there's a lot of other stuff going on, like a lot of drama baked into each scene, too, right? Like him and Kristen Ortega and him and Marion Bancroft, were, they're both where you're like, I don't even know if you should be doing this. Like, so there's a lot of kind of intrinsic drama to those scenes, which make which makes them cool. And then, yeah, like that tweet, I think, from Richard K. Morgan is telling, too, like this is something he's setting out to do. And the idea that this puts his book in a different category and that it goes against convention I think that's all by design. Like, yeah, he absolutely, that's what he set out to do. Yeah. So in that sense, mission accomplished, I think. <laughs> so yeah, thanks to Todd for that feedback. And if you guys wanted to send similar feedback or anything you guys wanted to say, uh, you can send that to inktofilm at gmail.com. Yeah, or you can connect with us on uh, social media, which we are all over. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at inktofilm on all three of those. Uh, I also wanted to say, if you wanted to help us, 
you could sh- if you could share our posts where we post the episode, that's a huge help because that gets it to more eyes and gets it more traction. And Facebook has this whole algorithm about who they'll show posts to, and you it helps us get around that if you share it. So yeah, if you want to help us out, share our social media posts, retweet our tweets, that kind of stuff, and it'll help us to grow. Or just in your day to day life, if you know somebody who you think would like the show, tell them about it. Um, our, yeah, we've been experiencing some good growth recently. And uh, we just want to keep that going. You know, that's that's our goal. Definitely. Another great way to help us out is if you rate and review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, it helps us out in a huge way and it helps get our podcast page ink to film. It, it, it gets more eyes on it in the iTunes store or on Spotify or wherever it's at. Yeah. And, and in addition to that, if you haven't subscribed, make sure to subscribe because apparently that's the biggest number. That's like what matters the most when like showing it to other people is number of subscribers so that helps us a lot make sure you just click that little subscribe button and that'd be a huge help uh but yeah if you want to leave a review you could leave a review like todd left for us after listening to this last episode and he says on itunes five stars spot on luke and james do a fantastic job of breaking down both books and movies in these they go in depth and don't pull any punches i like their enthusiasm and interesting takes as they peel the onion of each project The other interesting thing is how they play off each other's strengths, as one is a novelist and the other a scriptwriter. I don't think there is really anything else out there like this. I highly recommend. So yeah, you gotta start getting on some script writing over there, James. (laughs) Yeah, it's hard. You've written some scripts, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, but it's not my it's not my strength. That's not yeah yeah. But that's not like it's definitely it's definitely part of the job. You know, you got to get accustomed to it and. And like, I found myself collaborating with, with good writers more than writing my own scripts. Yeah. You, you're, you're more into like production and directing and like directing, that kind of stuff, yeah, right? producing that kind of thing. Producing. Okay. But still, I mean, that's not inaccurate to say you have no scripts. No, yeah, that's yeah. definitely. Yeah. So yeah, if you want to leave us something like that, that's a huge help. So thanks a lot to Todd for writing in and for leaving us that review. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, We also wanted to say thank you to Ross Bugden for the use of our intro and outro music. And thank you to Audible. They gave us an affiliate link. It's audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film. And with that, again, you get 30 free days and one free credit for any audiobook in their collection. Yeah, and if you wanted to go ahead and get a jump on Annihilation, use it for that. And you'll be ready to go for our next project after we finish out Altered Carbon. But uh, until then, we will see you for the Netflix series, which is coming up next. So I'm excited to watch it. And I hope you'll join us for that. That comes out on February 2nd. Yeah, Friday, I think. (laughs) Um, Yeah, until then, I'm Luke. And I'm James. See you guys.